you remember from last week, I mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 10 how we kind of hit the pinnacle of Solomon's reign. Where, where, I mean, he was an awesome king. He, was, he, he had a great heart to serve God. He started off, you know, asking for God for wisdom, was real humble. He, he served the Lord in, in, in a great manner until we got about halfway through chapter 10. And then we kind of see where it looks like the gold kind of got to him, the power kind of got to him, and, and he kind of got lifted up and his heart started to stray from the Lord. And I covered all that last week. I'm not going to re-preach that, but just to, you know, Provide the context of where we're starting off here in chapter 11. It's the, the continuing of the decline of Solomon as, as one of the kings that, uh, that you know, the, the, as basically the third king of Israel. Saul, David, Solomon, his son. Now, we're going to start off here. Look at verse number one. The Bible reads, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Now, I read last week also, because we went into this chapter a little bit and explaining how God did not want the children of Israel, his people that was supposed to be you know, called by his name and espousing the words of God and his laws to be going after and to marrying you know, these women of other nations that worshipped other gods, that had false gods for their gods. And he says, look, I don't want you intermarrying with them. You need to stay with your own people and, and people who serve the Lord. Now, it's not because God's a racist. It's not because he cared about the physical seed of Abraham intermingling with another physical seed. Because we see throughout Scripture that people of other lands can come and make themselves Jews. They could come and join themselves to the nation of Israel and worship the Lord, and they would be treated just like any other native-born person in the land. That was also part of God's law. So it's not that God cares about their race, right? Because there's a lot of people, that, I mean, even these days, it's not quite as, as, as popular as it once was, but there's been plenty of churches that, will, that, that believe that God doesn't want you to marry outside of your race. And I don't believe that to be true for a second. I think what God cares about is the belief. It's your, it's your religion. It's, it's are you putting your faith in the Lord or not? And these are the requirements that we find all throughout Scripture. And at the same thing, as, and as I just mentioned, you go back and read the Law of Moses and you'll see that people of other nations can come and join themselves to be a, a, of, of Israel and they are to be treated just like everybody else. And they are supposed to observe all the same things that the children, that the, the, the natural born children of Israel would. So, Going to these other nations and, the, and you know, marrying these women of the Moabites and the Ammonites, the reason why he's not supposed to do that is because they're worshiping other gods. And that's exactly what happens here is that Solomon decides that he knows the law. And think about this. Solomon knew the law. Solomon had wisdom. God gave Solomon more wisdom than anybody else ever had. He knew. He knew what he was doing. But I think the, the point to look at here, and what I want to point out is look at ver that the very end of verse number two, the last phrase, Solomon clave unto these in love. Solomon did it anyways, regardless of what God said, he did it for love. This is the reason why so many people get involved in so many various sins, because they call it love. Think about kids, right? When they're, when they're, when they're dating and everything else, they feel like, oh man, I love this person so much, and that's why they end up fornicating. And instead of calling it fornication, because you know, that's, not a, that's not a very pleasant word, right? That's pretty a negative connotation associated with the act. They want to call it, well, we're making love, right? We love each other. We're going we're gonna to appreciate, you know, we're going to enjoy this physical relationship with each other because we love each other. The Bible says that's fornication, that's wicked. 
when it's outside. That is completely against what God has for us. But they'll do things. We are willing to get into sin and to ignore the commandments of the Lord and not listen to what God has to say because, oh, it's for love. And they elevate love above God. Or their, let me put it this way, their concept of love above God. We know God is love. But they have a perverted and twisted understanding of love. Even Solomon. Solomon, oh, but I love these women. I love them. But well, you're not supposed to be loving them. Not in that way, according to God. You love them and, and preach them the truth. You, you give them the gospel, right? Love them that way. But you're not supposed to be marrying them and letting them turn your heart away from the Lord. Because God told you so. Because God knows better than you, Solomon. God knows better than you, whoever you are, that wants to think that, well, I can handle this. I'm super Christian. I, I have more wisdom than anybody else. I can allow myself to get close to these women. They're not going to turn my heart from God. I know better. I'm wise. It's the attitude that Solomon had, I'm sure. I'm sure he didn't get involved with these women thinking that I'm just going to completely build all these false altars, on, you know, these altars on these false gods and, and go out and end up worshiping and, you know, these other idols and things. You know, that, I'm sure that wasn't going on in his mind when he first started marrying these women and, and adding them as concubines and, you know, and making these wives of all of these various. I think he just looked at them and said, oh, wow, I could see, you know, he liked diversity. He, 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 looked on these women and thought they all had their own beauty and whatever, and he loved them. But it was wickedness. It was a sin found in Solomon, and it ended up turning his heart away. People put a big emphasis, emphasis on doing things for love. I mean, you hear about it in the music. You see it in the movies. Love is exalted above everything else, but it's always this perverted version of love. I mean, love is the reason why people commit adultery too, right? Oh, I don't love my spouse anymore. I don't love, they don't love me. I found my soulmate. Oh, we love each other. And that makes it okay for me to break my marriage vows before God and man and to split up my family and to cause the division and the strife in the home because I love this person. And everything's just going to be okay when we get together and we could just enjoy our love for each other. That's the narrative that's pushed in music. That's the narrative that's pushed in Hollywood. And it's a big fat lie. Yeah. That's the narrative that Solomon bought into. I'm going to cleave to these women in love and disregard the word of the Lord. In many ways. I mean, the Bible said, we saw that last week, that the king's not supposed to multiply wives unto himself. In, I, I don't know, but I think 700 wives and 300 concubines is multiplication. I, I think that's, that's beyond multiplying. That's like logarithmic. I mean, we're, we're talking exponential here with a thousand different women. That's more than just, just two, four, six, eight, right? That's, 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 that's a lot. That is a lot. But, but his reasoning was love. We need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of our emotions or these feelings that we think, oh, this is above all other things and, and, and elevate the status of love and, and forget that there are things called fornication and adultery that are not love. It is not loving at all. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three. Here we see, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Think about this. He clave unto these in love. How much love do you think Solomon had for any one of those individuals when you have 700 wives? It's not. How shallow is that love? When you have 700 wives, how much can you love any one of them individually? I mean, when you love someone, you spend time with them. When you love someone, you care for them. You're thinking about them. You're doing things for them, right? I mean, this is what naturally comes when you love people. When you have a love for the lost, you're going to be going out and preaching the gospel and knocking on their doors and trying to get, you know, when you have a love for your spouse, you're going to be spending time with them. You're going to have, you know, intimacy. You're going to be talking to one another. You're going to be spending time together. When you love your children, you're going to be doing the same thing. I mean, you're going you're to be spending time with them, doing things for them, teaching them, Right? When you have 700 wives, how much love can there possibly be? 
It's a false love. It's, a, it's, it's just, it's an excuse to, to, to get, to satisfy, I believe, to gratify his flesh and call that love. Because what, really what he really had was probably lust for these women. Exactly. And that's what he wanted to fulfill when, by having so many of them to be able to satisfy himself and not care about them. Because how could you care about them? They're not getting attention. I mean, oh, you could say, oh, but he, they got so much money and they were taken care of. Who cares? That money's not going to make any of those women happy. I mean, any, any, any people who are happily married, any women who get, are happily married today, think about it. I mean, and maybe you don't want to answer this question, but if, if you had the choice of, of you know, being married to a man that you're never going to see and just, okay, yeah, well, I could, I could live in a mansion, but like, I'm married to a husband, and you can't go out and get another husband. I mean, you're married to the one man, and he's never around ever, or he's spending time with other wives. Is it really worth it to have a lot of money and to just to, to sit around and eat? <laughs> Everyone's looking like, wait a minute, are you, you tell me, I don't know, is it worth it? <laughs> it's not. We know. It, it would be foolish to say, yeah, having all this money is worth it. The relationships that we build, having a good marriage, having, you know, having that, that bond and that love for one another is so much more precious than being able to eat good meals or, or have servants or whatever. It truly is. And anyone who has a relationship knows that that's the truth. But um, Solomon's claim that he clave unto these in love, even he didn't, he didn't have a very good love at all. Uh, let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number four. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Now do we see where his love got him? You think it was really worth it to have that, that, that pleasure, that, that fleshly pleasure for, for a, a season? Now to turn his heart? He started in his own disobedience to God's word by marrying all these various wives and going after women that he shouldn't have been looking at in the first place for a wife because they did not serve God, they did not worship God, they did not believe in the Lord. And then he ends up going after a goddess. That was the first one here. It says, for Solomon went after Ashtoreth in verse number five, the goddess of the Zidonians. He went from marrying all these various women now to going after some goddess. Then he ends up building high places and altars unto many false gods to satisfy all of his ungodly, unsaved wives. You think about it. Once, once you open up the doors for the first one, now you got 700 wives. But, you know, he wasn't thinking about all that when he married them all. He's thinking, oh, man, this is going to be great. Now you got him saying, oh, well, you built an altar for so-and-so. What about my God? Right? See, when you, when you stay consistent and you say, no, the Lord is the true God. We're not building any altars. I'm not going to hear it. I'm not going to have it from anyone. As soon as that first one turns his heart away and say, oh, okay, well, I love you so much. Okay, here, I'll, I'll build this for you. Go ahead and worship your false God. Now you're going to have seven, 700. Well, well, what about my God? What about my God? What, you can't do that for her, not for me. And before you know it, it's every abominable you know, false god, idol in, that he's married into now is, is receiving uh, an altar, is, is receiving even, you know, getting credibility. The nation of Israel is supposed to be a nation that serves the Lord. They're supposed to be the lighthouse dedicated unto God. And by the time you reach the third king, look at what's happening. So quickly they, they fall. So quickly we fall as human beings. And and this type of power and, and, and everything else happened. We need to learn from his mistake. Uh, one of the things for sure that we could learn, one of the lessons is be very careful who you marry. And one of the lessons we learn from this is that you're only supposed to be marrying people who are 
uh, saved people. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. I'm going to read for you from Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13, it talks about Solomon and his wives. Nehemiah 13, 23. You're turning to 1 Corinthians 7. Nehemiah 13, 23 says, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. He's saying this is in the problem, you know, when they were rebuilding the temple in the days of Nehemiah. He's saying they married these strange women that they weren't supposed to be marrying, right? And he said they can't even speak our own language. They can't even speak the Jews' language. Because you're, you're marrying these other people. They have these false gods. They can't, you're not even raising them right now because typically it's the, the man that's going to be working and the women are going to be raising the children. And you're marrying these, these women that, that don't speak the Jews' language and you're going to raise your children not to speak your own language. Verse number 25, And I contended with them and cursed them and smote them, certain of them and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto their sons nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. And this is the point I want to drive home is that even Solomon... Even Solomon, who had more wisdom than anyone else, even Solomon, who had this great relationship with God, God loved him, God blessed him, he's serving the Lord, he built the temple, he's offering all these sacrifices unto God, he's, you know, the kingdom is, is in a great state, everybody's happy, everybody's serving the Lord. Even Solomon had his heart turned by these outlandish women, meaning they were outside of that land, they were from another, they were foreigners, and they didn't believe in the Lord. If anybody had strength, Solomon had strength. If anyone had wisdom, Solomon had wisdom. Let him that thing at thee stand and take heed lest he fall. Because if you want to compare yourself to Solomon in wisdom and, and, and in your godly strength and in your relationship with God, you know, especially at the time he had it, you know, we're, we're going to become up lacking. Keep that in mind when you're looking at, especially those of you who aren't married. Obviously, if you're married, you're, you're married who you're married to. You're going to stay married. You know, God doesn't want you getting divorced. But for, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of young women in, this, in, in church tonight. We've got girls. We've got a lot of girls. You're going to be looking for someone to get married to. This is extremely important for your life when you're looking at someone to get married to. Find someone who has the same belief as you. Find someone who's, who's going to be a godly man to, to uh, serve the Lord with and is not going to turn your heart away from the Lord. And then in verse 27, I'm going to finish up Nehemiah 13. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress our God in marrying strange wives? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse number 39. We're going to see this same concept in the New Testament. I'm not going to all the various places. I've preached on this subject before on, on only marrying people in the Lord. But um, we're going to see here what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. Bound by the law. I mean, you, you, when you get married, you are married to that person until death do us part. That's what the Bible says. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Whom she will means to anyone that she wants to. She is at liberty. She's free from, that, from the marriage vow when her husband dies. Now, hey, you can get married again to whoever you want. But then the last phrase, only in the Lord. That's the requirement. It says only in the Lord. Get married to whoever you want. Just make sure that they're saved. Make sure that they are in Christ also. Only in the Lord. That is, uh, that is what's taught. And, and we see here, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, in those times where people had arranged marriages and this and that. Yeah, that was going on. But that's not even what the Bible taught ever either. The Bible teaches that you have liberty. And even here, it's talking about a woman, Right? It's not just the men that had the freedom to choose who they wanted to get married to. 
the women, the godly women of the Bible, what the Bible teaches is that they have liberty to decide who they want to get married to as well. Even when the, the wife was found for Isaac, right? They asked her. They said, do you want to go with this man? You know, and it was up to her. Yes, I want to go. Yes, I'll go and do this. That was her choice to go and do that. And, and all throughout the Bible, you're going to find that, you know, were there arranged marriages and all kinds of other things going on during this time? Sure there was. And there still are even today, but it doesn't mean it's right and that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you have liberty to be married to who you want, but God's restriction is marry somebody of the same faith. Marry someone who believes like you do. Because a marriage is so, is supposed to be so personal and you're so connected and, and interwoven with each other. And, you know, when a, a husband and wife come together, they too are one flesh. I mean, you are supposed to be like one body, one person working together to, to, in your lives for, for everything that you do. And when you're supposed to be that so closely knit together, something as personally held as, as your religion, as your faith in God, you don't want to have that differing from the person you're, you're yoking up with. The Bible says, you know, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that is, there, is, there isn't much more of a, of a permanent yoke than marriage, right? I mean, you're yoking up together, and, and that's who you're dedicating yourself to be with until one of you dies. So, keep that in mind. Even King Solomon had his heart turned away by marrying these women that, that didn't believe on the Lord, that had their false gods. And he wasn't, you know, he didn't convert them. They converted him. Verse number nine. And if not, I'm not necessarily saying they converted him to no longer believe in God, but they got him to do all kinds of sin that he, that he wouldn't have normally done. Okay, I'm not saying he believed in Molech. I think he still believed in the Lord, but but he built the altars to them and, and just grossly backslid and, and did all these horrible things and built all these altars unto, uh, unto these false gods that he wouldn't have done. And his heart was turned from, from serving the Lord in, uh, in pureness. Let's get back to the chapter here, verse number nine. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. Yeah, God actually appeared to Solomon and, and like spake to Solomon two times in his life. Not very many people can say that you've had God directly like, like speaking to you. God asked Solomon, ask me what, you know, what you want, basically. And, and answered Solomon's prayer. That's a pretty amazing thing. And, and God's looking at this going, I spake with you twice. And now you're, you're going after these false gods and you're, and you're turning on me like this. That made God pretty angry. So here's what he did. Let's keep reading. Um, verse 10, And he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. So God's telling him, because you did this, I'm going to tear this kingdom apart from you, and, and you're going to be left with just one. And the only reason why you're going to be left with anything is because of David. Not because of you, Solomon, because of David. Because David's heart was right with the Lord all of his life. And I preach an entire sermon on this, but I'm just going to mention briefly what, you know, the influence that one person can have is immense. One person. You think, my life is meaningless. What can I do? No, what you can do is a lot. And the impact that you can have on other people is a lot. And the impact that you can have on future generations is a lot. And it's, it's based on your faith with God and your walk with God. David's influence continued beyond his death. The way that he chose to live his life and to not give up in the end and not to just give in to backsliding and whatever else carried forward to his next generation and to, to subsequent generations even after that. 
because of his dedication and his faith. Unfortunately, Solomon's influence also continued beyond his death, but not for the better part, for the worse. And, and I preached on uh, generational blessings and cursings, where I went into a lot more examples and details of this, uh, how people can have much more of an influence on generations to come. But, I mean, David, you say, well, well, didn't David commit adultery and murder? Yes, he did. He did. He sinned big time. But you know what he also did? He repented. And his heart was still right with God. And when he was confronted with his sin, he didn't do what King Saul did. He didn't try to make excuses for it. He didn't try to say, oh, you don't understand. Oh, I, you know, I, I really didn't sin. I actually did what God wanted me to do. He said, you're right, I sinned. God, you know, like, like, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on these people. It's not their fault. You know, David did do sins. He numbered the children of Israel too. Okay, he failed at some times. But his heart was right because he repented in sackcloth and ashes because he got right with God and he was always turning back and saying, God, I'm sorry, I screwed up. You know, help me through. His heart was right and genuine with God his whole life. That is why, and that is what God wants from us. Does he want us to be perfect? You bet he does. He wants us to obey his commandments. Of course he does. They're not suggestions, they're commandments. But he also knows that we have a sinful flesh. He knows the sinful nature. He doesn't excuse it. But what he ultimately wants at the end of the day is for our hearts to be right with him. So that way when, when, when the, the sin happens, we can just get on our knees, repent, and, and be right with God. And God holds that as a high value and something that he will bless you for and will bless your children for and bless their children for. And in David's case, I mean, he let David have a, a, a son on the throne, you know, all the way through their cap uh, up until their captivity. Right? And ultimately leading in the, the birth of Jesus Christ, the, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But um, the way we live our life, we need to make sure that we're, we're not fainting. We're staying until the end. Let's keep reading here, verse number 14, because now we're going to see some other things start to happen. And all these various events that start to happen, God raises up basically these, these people to annoy Solomon and, and, to, and to start troubling him and, and causing problems within the kingdom. Now, these are all a result of things that, uh, that they stemmed from an earlier time during the reign of David, but I believe they're a direct consequence of Solomon's sin. I don't think that any of these things would have happened the way they did had Solomon not sinned, had Solomon kept his heart right with the Lord. But let's read these, and we're going to look at a few of these examples that are given here. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite, he was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. So when these wars were going on in the time of David's reign, they thought they had, they had cut off all the men of the land of Edom in, this, in, this, um, in, you know, in one of these battles here. But, it says in verse 17, that Hadad fled, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. So this Hadad, he was one of the, you know, the, the king of, of that nation. He was one of the, his sons. He was one of the descendants. So he was in line to be king. And um, he was of the king's seed. So when they came in and destroyed the whole nation, you know, they destroyed all the people, some people escaped. They got out of there, right? They're, they're going through for six months. They're making sure that they're wiping everybody out in the land. Well, they fled into Egypt. They got away. They hightailed it out of there. Verse 18 says, And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him a house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. So here's the, the, you know, the king of Edom, or the king of Edom's ch child, right, his seed, goes into Egypt, king of Egypt goes, okay, I'll recognize you as royalty and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out here. You know, Egypt and, and Edom didn't have problems with each other, so Pharaoh welcomes them in and he gives them land. He, give, you know, he, he takes care of them. Verse 19 says, And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife, the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tapanes, the queen. 
And the sister of Tapanes bare him Genubath, his son, whom Tapanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Genubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. So he, he's basically growing up in Pharaoh's household. He gets his wife. Things are going great. I mean, he's well taken care of. And uh, it says in verse 21, And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to mine own country. See, this whole time he was, he was fearful. As long as David and Joab were around, I mean, those were the guys that destroyed all of his people. And they find out that one of the king's seed is still alive. They're going to go after him too. But they find out, okay, they're dead. He's like, now I want to go back to my own people. I want to go back to, to, that, to my own country. Verse 22, then Pharaoh said unto him, but what hast thou lacked with me? That behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country. And he answered nothing. Howbeit, let me go in any wise. Now, this is just one thing that happened. And I'm speculating here, but I think that if had Solomon not done you know, committed his sins and gone after these strange gods and stuff. I don't think that Hadad would have gone and wanted to have this desire to go back to his own people and to become a trouble unto King Solomon because God had granted him peace. But now it's, it's like we see as a direct result of Solomon being disobedient and Solomon's heart being turned away, now God's starting to cause problems for him. Now, even though he's not reigning the kingdom from him just yet, he's starting to cause a problem. He's starting to bring his judgment upon him through these various other people Hadad being one of them. And I think he's, he's working in Hadad's heart. You know, God's working in Hadad saying, hey, why don't you go back to your own country? And, you know, and kind of working for him to get back and to cause these problems for Solomon. Verse number 23. And we see that God's doing it because verse 23 says, and God stirred him up another adversary. God is stirring these people up. God is, is, is working in these people's lives to get them to start causing problems for Solomon as a result of his sin. Verse 23, And God stirred him up another adversary, Reason, the son of Eliada, which fled from his lord, Hadad Ezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon. Beside the mischief that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. So, Israel wasn't at war with these people, but they kept on causing all kinds of problems and creating mischief and, and just really causing a lot of problems in the kingdom for Solomon um, in his days because God is, is kind of stirring these people up to start, start bringing these problems to Solomon. And then verse 26, now we're going to be introduced to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, a very uh, a critical figure in the Bible, especially during the time of the book of the Kings. He's referred to constantly. He ended up doing some wicked things. We're going to get into that um, in the coming weeks. But we're going to see here his start and, and where he began. Look at verse number 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zerida, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman. Even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Millo and repaired the breaches of the city of David his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So Jeroboam, he's, he's, a, he's a valiant man. He's a man of war. He's a mighty man. He's, a, he's an industrious man. He's a hard worker. Solomon notices this about him. He says, you know what? I'm going to hire this guy. I'm going to take him to be, he's going to work for me. I mean, I could see here's someone who's doing a lot of work. Here's someone who's going places. I want him working for me. And um, he put him in the charge of the house of Joseph, verse 29. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. I think it's kind of funny. So Jeroboam's out there. He's got this brand new garment. And he runs across Ahijah, and, and Ahijah takes hold of the garment, and, and he <laughs> chops it up into 12 pieces. Like, whoa, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I just got this thing. It's brand new. Why are you cutting up my clothes into 12 pieces? And it says uh, in verse 31, And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake. See, again, we're seeing David being brought up and the influence that David had for his heart being right. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. 
Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he kept my commandments and my statutes, but I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. So this prophet comes to Jeroboam and he's saying, look, here's what's going to happen. Solomon's sin. Now that he's get, got people going after these strange gods. So for that reason, God's going to separate this king. He's going he's to take it away from Solomon's son. He's going to take it away from Solomon and you're going to get ten parts. You're going to be the king over ten tribes. And he's going to leave one unto, uh, unto David's household, just as a memorial for David, right? And he said, they're going to be over Jerusalem. And obviously there's one left. You got the Levites, right? So they're one of the tribes. But um, so he says, they're going to get one. You're going to be ruler over 10. And he explains fully. It's because they go after those other gods. And he's telling them that um, they didn't keep my commandments and my statutes. So I'm going to give you 10. Verse number 36 says, um, and he explains too, he says, I'm not going to give it to you in Solomon's days, but in his son's days. So he's giving him the timeline. He's saying, be ready for this. You're going to, get king. You're going to be king over, over 10 of the tribes in the days of Solomon's son. Verse, 30, uh, verse 36, and unto his son will I give one tribe that David my servant may have a light all way before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, put my name there. Uh, and I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. This is the same thing that he told Solomon. It's the same thing he told David, right? His, his standard hasn't changed. He's saying, look, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have this kingdom. I'm going to ensure it. You're going you know, to do great if you just follow my commandment. Just keep your heart right and keep doing right by me. And I won't have to come in and judge you. I won't have to come in and take it away from you. But we're going to see later that Jeroboam just completely does the opposite and it takes a lot less time than it did for Solomon to, to screw up. Verse 39, And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. He says, I'm, I'm going to cause them problems. I'm going to afflict them, but not forever. Verse 40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So, because of this whole story, Solomon finds out basically what happened. Solomon finds out that this guy's, you know, the kingdom's going to be taken away from Solomon and it's going to be given to this guy. And he's out to kill him. Now, this just shows you where Solomon's heart was. Solomon didn't hear that and go, oh man, I screwed up. God's angry with me because I, I've totally screwed up here and now my son is going to have to pay the consequence of what I did and maybe I should get things right with God. Maybe I should humble myself and just go to God and beg and plead with him, God, please don't take the kingdom away. I'm sorry. Is that what he did? No. Instead, he tried to kill Jeroboam. What did Jeroboam do to him? Nothing. Jeroboam was an industrious man. Jeroboam, as far as Solomon's concerned, was doing everything right. It's not Jeroboam's fault that God chose him, right? But it's the same way. See, Solomon ended up with the same attitude as Saul. When Saul found out that the kingdom's rent from you and I'm giving it to someone better than you, right? And he knew that David had the Spirit of God upon him. What did Saul try to do? He was continually trying to kill David. This is what happens when, when people's hearts get fall out and, and are not right with the Lord and, and you're just completely walking in the flesh and that's all you can think of is just like, well I'm just gonna kill this guy. That's not an answer. That's not gonna work for him. And you know at that point he's fighting against God. 
God's appointed this man and you're going to go out and try to kill him. Good luck trying to fight against God. Wrong choice, Solomon. Let's keep reading. I'm going to finish up the chapter and then there's a couple things I want to go over real quick. Um, so Jeroboam goes and, and he flees. He goes in Egypt. He's saying, okay, well, forget this. He's trying to kill me. And he knows that his reign isn't coming until Solomon's son reigns anyways. Right? So he, he takes off. He goes to Egypt. He's safe there until Solomon dies and he comes back. Verse 41, And the rest of the Acts of Solomon and all that he did and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. So now we're concluding at the end of this chapter, the life of Solomon. We have all his great works, all the great things he did. Unfortunately, he ended up his life in a very, very bad way. Not the way that, that we should, any of us should be ending our lives. Turn, if you would, to Galatians 6 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm going to close with, with a couple of uh, scripture from the New Testament here. See, had Solomon kept serving the Lord, I believe that he would not have the trouble from all those other people. You know, God's raising up these, he's stirring up these adversaries because I believe the fear of God would still be in them to not go and cause trouble because Solomon's worshiping the Lord and, and would have that, you know, and you notice when the children of Israel are doing right, and even if not, not the whole nation, even with just individuals, like when Abraham was doing right and he's following the Lord and doing what the Lord said, God protects him. When, even when Jacob, you know, he put the fear of those people, or he put the fear of God basically in, you know, in the other people round about. When they were worried, Abraham's worried that, oh man, the other people, the nations are going to come, they're going to kill me, they're going to do something. God made sure that nobody harmed him. God made sure the same thing with Jacob, right? When, when he was getting into trouble and his children went and killed people, he put the fear in the nations round about so that they wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything to him. And that's the faith that's required to serve God, that we know that, hey, look, if we're going to do what's right, we don't have to worry about what the world's going to do. We don't have to worry about what the heathen are going to do. We don't have to worry about all these various people. We don't have to worry, as Jeroboam and son Nebat does, we're going to see later, that, that the people are going to turn against you. Look, when God ordained you to be king, you don't got to worry about the people leaving you because God's put you in that position. You don't have to turn to these false idols and build these calves. You don't have to worry, you know, if Solomon wouldn't have, would have just listened to God, he wouldn't have to worry about, about Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, taking over the kingdom from him if he was doing that which is right. Now, but these troubles happened to Solomon as a result of him trashing his testimony and becoming a big hypocrite. And that is, is, is probably one of the worst things that he did. We need to make sure that we finish strong and not fail at the end of our life. Especially someone like Solomon. I mean, everybody's looking to him. His, his life was being known. And remember, we saw this earlier. Last week, I believe it was, when the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. Remember that? We went over that. That was his fame, was concerning the name of the Lord. And I said, I preached on that and said, hey, that should be us. That should be what we're striving to do. Not to get a whole bunch of fame for ourselves, but get a fame concerning the name of the Lord that at least we could be associated with, hey, bringing a lot of glory and honor unto God's name and doing his great work for the Lord. And when Solomon built the temple and he had all these people and he had all these sacrifices and everything going on and the news spread around the world, the Queen of Sheba heard about it, they heard his fame concerning the Lord. When you're doing things like that, it's all the more important to keep yourself in check and that you keep your testimony right and that you don't get involved in these sins and you, you stay the course unto the end because now that man Solomon who had done all these great things in the minds of all the heathen round about when they see, huh, wasn't that great after all. What he did wasn't that important. It wasn't that big of a deal because he ends up going and serving these other gods anyways. He didn't really believe in what he did because look at what ended up happening to him. He's just a big stinking hypocrite. And that brings the, you know, the glory and honor away from God 
through that man's sin and disobedience. And you end up causing way more damage when you get involved in these things. Now, it also underscores the importance why we don't, we don't put faith in man, but we have faith in God. Now, it's a big disappointment, and it's really discouraging, and it's sad when men of God end up caving in and falling and succumbing to pressure. But we should never be looking to any one individual no matter how on fire they are right now, no matter how much they're bringing glory and honor to God, no matter how much happens, if that, you don't want to be in the position where if a man falls, it's going to destroy your faith in God. Because men are sinners and men fall. And the truth of the matter is, what Solomon did doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change the, the truth of God. It doesn't change how great God is. It doesn't change any of that. But when people end up, because it does happen, people end up looking to a man and they're going to see, well, if you're a reflection of who God is, then why do I want to have anything to do with your God when you end up doing all these things, right? And, it, and this is the reality of the situation. This is what people look at. And it's important for us to keep our testimony pure and true unto God so that we don't give the, the adversaries the opportunity to speak evil against God based on our actions. And it's also just important for us to be doing what's right by God anyways, right? So it's, it's, you know, it's, there's multi-purpose there of, of obeying God's word. We don't want to bring, but especially the more you're known for doing what's right, the more you got to be diligent in taking heed that you don't fall and making yourself sure, man. And, and if and every once in a while, that means you got to slow down a little bit and just make sure, hey, I'm... I'm not going to fall. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going so fast and letting things get to my head too much that, you know, that things are going to get out of control. We need to maintain sobriety. We need to maintain humility in our life and know that, hey, we, we're going to try to keep ourselves from, um, from a great disaster. Look at Galatians 6, verse number 9. The Bible reads, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. See, I think what ended up happening with Solomon, I think Solomon lost a lot of rewards. I think Solomon was, was, was doing great with what he had done in his life and his achievements. But because of his basically stumbling and falling and, and not getting back up to finish that race near the end of his life, he lost a lot of what he had accumulated up to that point, unfortunately. And, uh, but... You know, the Bible says here, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 7. Similar concept, we see the Apostle Paul near the end of his life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me. Give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Apostle Paul earned himself a crown. Not, I mean, this isn't talking about salvation. Apostle Paul was saved by grace through faith, like all of us are. But he attained and earned a crown that God's going to give him. Uh, he, he, he earned rewards that's going to be granted to him in heaven as a result of him fighting the good fight keeping the faith, finishing the course, and finishing strong. That's what's going to get us our rewards. And we want to make sure that we are um, keeping that always in our minds. And then Revelation 2 and 3, I'll just read this for you. Revelation 2.10 says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Again, another crown. He said, You be faithful. You stick with it. You stay the course. I know it's scary. You're going to be thrown into prison. You're going to be facing death. You be faithful all the way unto death. I'm going to give you a crown. In Revelation 3.11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He said, hold on to it. Hold on tight to the end. We need to, we're, we're in a race. We need to finish our race. We need to finish it strong. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So don't get so caught up in, a, in thinking it's a sprint that you're going to burn yourself out and fall and not finish the race. 
keep in mind the, 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 the prize, keep in mind the goal, keep in mind yourself and your own flesh and, and sin and, and take heed to yourself so that you don't fall and, and fall after the example of Solomon. Solomon gave us a lot of examples, many good examples and, and unfortunately some bad examples here as well. But let's learn from them. Let's not fall into the same trap that, that Solomon fell into. Let's, let's use God's word. He gave this word, you know, all these stories to us for a reason. Let's, uh, let's apply these to our lives and, um, and not make those same mistakes. As far as I have a word of prayer, dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your, your words. God, we, we pray that you would please just continue to open up the scripture to us. Help us to learn these great truths that you have for us. Help us to make the right decisions in our life. Lord, I pray for all of the, the, the individuals in our church here that are unmarried, that are going to be looking to get married one day. I pray that you would please help them to have guidance and wisdom and finding a spouse, dear Lord, and that you would, um, you, you would just stir up their spirit to, to stay true to your word and not to get caught up in this fake notion of love, this, this superficial love that Solomon got caught up into, when he, when he married 700 wives and had 300 concubines, dear Lord, and, and help, us, help us not to get deceived by the, the media, by the, the, the Hollywood movies and the, the, the music industry that wants to tell you what love is. Help us to get our, our definition of love and our understanding of love from your word and that, uh, that these individuals would find someone who's truly going to love them and that they could love uh, uh, reciprocally and, and, and serve you with one heart, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.